then uh, from 1999, we didn't really start shooting the film to 2004. But getting close to Ben and getting close to Carolyn Goodman changed my life. And I thought it was extremely important that this story get told, the truth of the story get told. And, of course, most uh, most Americans were familiar with the story, in order from the Mississippi burning. But you've, you centered a lot of the film on the actual trial of the only person so far uh, found guilty of being involved in these killings. Uh, and you were also able to capture this, this the to talk to the jurors as well. Talk about that experience and the and how open people were to talking with you about such a, a deep wound in the in the history of Mississippi. Well, let me just say, when we started shooting this film in 2004, at the 40th anniversary, we had no idea that 10 months later Edgar Killam would get indicted. We actually thought we were going to make a film to try to embarrass the state of Mississippi to finally do the right thing. We actually started out following a group of 30 people uh, from the Philadelphia Coalition, 15 whites and 15 blacks, who for the first time in 40 years decided to talk about this case and ask for some kind of justice. So we start to follow them. Also, I was very close to the families of the victims, and Carolyn Goodman was in her upper 80s. Uh, Fannie Lee Cheney was in ill health and in her 80s. And if something was going to get done in terms of some sense of justice, because obviously justice could never bring back those kids, that we wanted to do something about that. Um, the people in town were fairly open to us, actually. Um, and we went into very different parts of Neshoba County to really get a cross-section of the feelings. And we really wanted to get at the truth, because we really felt that the truth had been shoved under the rug. And how could s these three murders happen, everybody know who did it, and nobody be held accountable? Well, let's go to Jerry Mitchell now, a reporter for the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi. You really helped um, Edgar A. Killen uh, get indicted. Talk about who he was, who he is. Well, Edgar Ray Kellen was, a, a, as mentioned before, a, a Baptist preacher, and he was kind of the organizer, clan organizer. And so that day, uh, what happened is after uh, the three civil rights workers were arrested, he was basically contacted. Cecil Price put out word to Billy Wayne Posey, who in turn got word to Edgar Ray Kellen that they were in jail, the civil rights workers were in jail, and they only had a little bit of time, so they needed to, to act now. And so Killen then drove down to Meridian, Mississippi, gathered up a bunch of Klansmen, and they drove back uh, to Neshoba County, to Philadelphia, Mississippi. And there they waited, basically, for the civil rights workers to, uh, to leave jail. It was all part of a plan, basically. And uh, once they were released, you know, chased them down. and. And, and, of course, caught them and, and killed them and buried their bodies in a dam. So Killen was very much kind of the organizer of that and, and made it happen. And, and Jerry Mitchell, in terms of the uh, why it took so long for anyone to be brought to justice in, uh, in this case, how long were sure. you writing about it before uh, there was a, a, an indictment of at least of killing? Actually, I started writing about this case back in 1989. Uh, that's when I first began. It was the first case I wrote about. Began writing about what evidence still existed. Uh, wrote about the transcript still existing and began talking to and interviewing witnesses such as Delmar Dennis and, and others, who unfortunately died, by the way, of course, did not testify in Killen's trial. So I, I began writing about it back then. Of course, what helped is the fact that uh, I also began writing about the Megar Evers case. That case got reopened, got reprosecuted. Byron D. LeBeck was convicted in 1994. Uh, came back after a series of other convictions, came back to the case because I found out that Sam Bowers had, had bragged that while he was convicted, he was happy about it because the main instigator of the entire affair walked out of the courtroom a free man, and he was referring to Edgar Ray Killen. And that was in, my story on that appeared in 1998. And then you see how much later it was after, even after that. Um, so it just, just took it took six years. quite a bit of prodding and 
Let's, yeah, exactly. Let's go to, to another prodding. clip from the film Neshoba. During the trial, Edgar Ray Killen's attorney questioned former Klansman Mike Hatcher. Who swore you in that night, that day, night, whatever it was? Edgar Ray Killen, preacher did. Did you ever hear any talk of, of there being an elimination of the civil rights workers? Yes, sir, I've heard it discussed, and I didn't know the Klan would ever do anything like that, me being a police officer. You stated that Edgar uh, called you out and said, we got rid of the civil rights workers, is that correct? That's correct. What else did he say? He said we wouldn't have no more trouble with goatee. And then he, he never did and say that I right. told him I did, but said I told him we got rid of them of which he is a bald-faced liar there. And he told me that he was at the funeral home, signed the book, made sure he talked to people in front and rear of him, and that was his alibi. And my estimate was at that time that 99% of the people wish they had been the ones that got them. But there again, since I didn't do it, I never did get to play the hero and say, hey, I did it. No, no way. If those three had stayed at home where they belong, they'd have never found any home here. And that last voice was Edgar Ray Killens. These are some excerpts from the closing arguments in the Edgar Ray Killen case. These acts were not sanctioned by God. They were sanctioned by that man right there, by that defendant. You know, there's an old saying in the South, you know, we've done a day's work when you make a preacher cuss. Well, I figured I did a pretty good day's work on that day to make him cuss. So. I had mentioned to you here that I had lost my emotions, but he brought a little bit back. When he got a little further than I could reach him, I almost got out of the wheelchair and my attorneys caught me. I'm trying to stay away from the word hatred, but the man doesn't have any morals. It's a cowardly act. That was a mob. It murdered those young men down there that night. And that coward's still sitting right here in this courtroom. He wants one of you to be weak and not do your duty to find him guilty of this crime. If we don't know who killed him, how do we know Edgar's the one that planned it and orchestrated it? The real crime was the fact that he was not prosecuted in 1964. This is nothing but a but steering a simmering pot of hate for profit and cultural sluggishness. That's all this case is for. Look at all these folks sitting out here. This is nothing but a show to try to put the state of Mississippi on trial again. Edgar Ray Killen directed others to commit this crime, and that's what makes him equally guilty as them. Is a Neshoba County jury going to tell the rest of the world that we are not going to let Edgar Ray Killen get away with murder anymore? Those are uh, excerpts from, from the closing arguments uh, in the murder trial of uh, Edgar Ray Killen. Uh, and um, I'd like to ask Jerry Mitchell, the, uh, you have been crusading around these, these murders now for several years, uh, for decades now. What has been the response in Mississippi of your, the readers of the Clarion Ledger and, and of the, your neighbors and friends to uh, your efforts to uncover the truth? Well, it's been it's been mixed. I mean, the reactions have been mixed. I, I've had uh, some people who are obviously happy about it, glad to see justice come, even after all these years. And then, of course, I've had others who, uh, you know, have cursed me or told me to leave it alone or even threatened me. I've had people threaten me, so it's uh, it's it's been kind of a mixed bag. And how about within the newspaper itself? Because obviously, uh, before you were reporting there, back in the in the sixties, the Clarion Ledger was right. part of the infrastructure that allowed, uh, uh, not, uh, promoted segregation and backed some of these efforts. What's been the response uh, in the newspaper? Well, the, actually, within the newspaper itself, has been very positive. Uh, uh, you're correct. The newspaper back in the sixties was one of the most racist newspapers in America, but fortunately that's changed today. Uh, we actually have an African-American executive editor, so it's, it's, it's a totally different newspaper than it was back then. Uh, but I've had complete support allowing me to kind of pursue these cases, which is amazing when I think about it, that they've let me do this for now more than 20 years. 
We're going to break and then come back, and we'll be bringing in the author of a new book called Freedom Summer. Bruce Watson is joining us from Massachusetts, as well as continue our conversation with our guest, Jerry, Jerry Mitchell of the Clarion Ledger, Ben Cheney.